Oh, good. So I'll, on the strength of that, I'll hand over to Peter. And um, thank you very much for accepting our request to do a presentation. Okay, I'll thank you. The floor. Thanks, Stuart. And uh, good evening to everyone watching. And um, yep, I'm contrary to the background uh, that you might have seen or the, the pitch I'm, I'm not down at the pier, I'm actually at home. So um, um, yeah, the uh, um, topic is fun with QRP. So I'll talk all about equipment, antennas and operating for low power amateur radio. Um, uh, as to what is QRP, most people know it as five watts or less. Some people argue maybe 10 watts SSB, but basically foundation power level or a bit less for all modes. Um, you can do pretty much any amateur activity with QRP and arguably some amateur activities are best with QRP. Um, so I'll talk about those later on. Um, the sorts of reasons why you want to do it. Well, the challenge of making contacts with low power, um, especially if you find that you've already um, done a lot with high power, you might have already worked lots of countries with 400 watts, then you might want to go and do it all again with 5 watts. Another possibility is enjoying homebrew gear, the elegance of simplicity. You can actually build a voice transceiver for 40 metres using just 7 or 8 transistors and that can be QRP. You can even, with not very many more parts, make it SSB rather than double sideband. So there's variations there. And there's some new, new technology, new development in software-defined radios with some of the new chips being able to achieve a sort of SSB. I believe there's a bit of distortion with very, very few parts. So, so there's some uh, innovation going on there. Battery or solar power. Um, of course, with QRP, you're not drawing much current, so that means you don't have to take as much along stored energy. So you can uh, take lightweight batteries and uh, um, hike longer distances and climb higher summits more efficiently if you only need to take along a small battery. And there's also the potential of the solar. There are some portable awards, summits of the air, VKFF, um, that are based on you operating from summits or national parks where QRP can be handy if you want a small light equipment to take into them. Weak signal data modes and uh, then there's um, uh, like FT8, uh, JS8, um, Whisper. In fact right now I'm transmitting Whisper so if you were to look at the WhisperNet website you can see where my 200 milliwatt signal is being received and chances are that it's probably being received in, on the other side of the world on seven megahertz at the moment so uh, um, certainly quite efficient. Um, also uh, a bit of a speciality for me as you can see in the pictures HF pedestrian mobile so I'll talk a bit about that. As to whether it works um, of course we're, we're pretty much in the bottom of the solar cycle maybe just coming up so the next few years will be very good time to be started with QRP. Um, but for now, you can make worldwide contacts. I've made um, not particularly necessarily reliable with, with five watts, uh, particularly on SSB, but you can still, if the conditions are right, make some long distance contacts um, to the um, other side of the world. If not, you can at least often work into New Zealand or VK6 with QRP on bands like 20 meters. So, there's still certainly potential for QRP, even though people might be grumbling that conditions are quite poor. Um, you can still have success with mobile and portable. And then there's the satisfaction of using gear that you've built yourself. Um, as for transceiver choices, um, there's some great new rigs that have come out recently. Um, I'll talk about those later on. But your basic choices are 100 watt transceiver with power reduced. Um, that's... Um, um, got uh, some advantages if you're at home. Um, if you are intending only to have one transceiver and on a watts per dollar basis, a 100 watt transceiver is a better value than a 5 watt transceiver. Um, the main issue there is the current consumption of a 100 watt rig is high, especially on receive. And even when turned down to 5 watts, it might still be drawing 
I don't know, five, eight, maybe 10 amps with, with low power. So they're not that efficient as far as power goes. So um, there's limitations, but if you've only got one rig and you've got a limited budget, then a 100 watt rig turned down to QRP is a great way to get the experience of low power. Another possibility is a dedicated QRP rig. Um, you can buy those new or even the second hand market for dedicated QRP rigs. And with some of the new rigs coming out, there's a possibility that people will be selling off their older rigs. So you might be able to pick up some bargains there. Um, a potential for a kit. Um, now some kits require you to solder in all the parts. Others might have the surface mount parts already soldered in. So it's just the through hole components. There's still other kits that have almost about 90% of things soldered in, and it's just a matter of making a few other wide connections and then you're on the air. So a lot of choice at the moment with kits. Um, then there's home brew building from scratch, which I do a little bit as well for uh, QRP. Um, as far as new QRP transceivers, um, probably the most famous is the Yaesu FT817-818. If you've already got an 817, don't bother about getting an 818. It's almost identical. Um, it's got a little bit more output power, not significant. A little bit better battery, not significant if you're using external batteries. I believe the, <coughs> excuse me, the TCXO is standard with the 818. Um, but um, yeah, the great benefit of it, and I use an FT817 myself, is that it's a small package that gives you all bands from 160 meters to 70 centimeters, all modes. Um, it's also got two antenna sockets, which is useful for VHF field days. So you can have the two meter antenna on one connection, two options, two meter antenna on the other. So I definitely recommend um, personal experiences FT817. I have an FT817ND or the very similar FT818, which you can buy new. Um, the main thing is that it's a little bit heavier than some QRP rigs. Um, it draws a bit more current on receive than some of the really small QRP rigs. But as a do anything QRP rig, it's a great option. And um, also, I find that it's um, even, you know, people see my videos and they see all the sand in the dial but, or, or in the display, but yeah, it still works. It's a very robust rig. Um, and I, I think it's ideally suitable for some of the portable work. Um, the next in the middle of the screen is there's a couple of Ellie crafts, um, a KX3, which has a bit more output power, a bit better receiver, lower receive current consumption. Um, it's got a few extra features that the Yaesu doesn't have. However, it doesn't have two meters or 70 centimeters, um, but I think you can get transverters. I reckon it's less robust. If you look at it, I've seen one or two and they look like Swiss cheese. There are always holes in the side for sockets and things. If you are operating it from say a national park and you've got the rig really in a nice box and it's really out of the wind and the salt water and all that, then um, your picnic table operating, it might be okay. But um, as a robust rig, it's probably less robust than the Yesu. And the other thing as well is the price tag is much, much more. Um, so it's probably not the sort of rig that you'd be wanting to bash around because of its price tag. There's also a KX2, which is, you know, doesn't have all the bands. It starts off at 80 meters rather than 160 meters. Um, and um, for general soda and portable operating, um, that's another rig that you could consider. It's a little bit smaller than the KX3 as well. Um, but I, I think it's got the same issues that I mentioned with the, um, the holes in the side of the box. And then finally, there's a rig that's only just come out a month or two ago, the ICOM 705. Uh, I have heard them on the air. They sound great. Um, they've got quite a, they are a true software, you know, software defined radio architecture. Unlike the FT817818, which is basically 20 year old design. The 705, it's got a uh, main thing. It's got the display screen across the bottom. Um, and that's potentially useful to graphically see activity on the band. It could also be handy for microwave people if they're using uh, a transverter for 10 gigahertz or whatever on an ICOM 705. If their frequencies are a bit off and they've got a, a spectrum display, then that could be handy. 
to find the other station. Um, they are, in terms of their price tag, they are quite a lot dearer than the FT818. It's only got one antenna socket as well, um, but they are probably a better rig overall. They've, put, they've got similar current consumption, I think, to the Yesu, but they are a different um, type of shape for the transceiver. Um, a bit like a small shoebox type thing. They're not very, they're not very deep. Um, but they, um, uh, whereas I like to use the FT817 in a bag over the shoulder for my pedestrian mobile, um, with the ICOM 705, you might do it a little bit differently, but I have seen, I think you can get bags for the ICOM 705 to carry it in, so there's a potential there. Um, and even, I've even seen heard people using it as a handheld type um, thing. Um, but you have to be careful about supporting the antenna. Um, so yeah, um, the 705 is certainly a rig to consider, a bit higher, a bit more expensive than the Yesu, but there are some reasons why you might want to go with it, especially if you're into uh, SDR. Um, another possibility for you um, is a, if, if your budget is a bit lower than the Yesu FT817, um, there's a Ziju, I think it's pronounced, it's only 80 to 10 metres. Um, it's got a few rough, rough edges. Uh, it's worthwhile to look at the reviews on websites like Eham. It does need external filters for some bands because it, it doesn't have all the filters for all the bands to have a clean output. Um, another possibility are these tiny little LNR MTR series. There's several types you can get. Um, they're not cheap. Um, so you'd only justify them if you were a CW fan and you want something ultra light for mountain topping. You, there are some cases where you where every kilogram or every hundred gram helps. Like if you save a kilogram on the transceiver or on the battery, then that's an extra liter of water you can take. And sometimes that's critical. Um, there are cases where you are going on an expedition and you want to take other things, maybe you know extra clothing, tents, that sort of thing. And then you're really looking to scale down on the radio and you can only take the least amount of radio, then something like these tiny LNRs might be uh, a good choice for ultralight um, multi-day hikes. The thing about them is they um, um, are fine for keeping skeds and that sort of thing. They don't, that you can see one in the picture's got up and down buttons. So for scanning the bands, um, they're not as good as a transceiver with a VFO box. So um, for DX contesting, um, uh, intensive operating, maybe not so good as the 817, 818, but otherwise um, it's something to consider because they use such little current on receive, yet they put out five lots, I think, some of them, and, uh, and they, they might do a few bands that are the busier bands, like 40 and 20 metres. So that's something to consider, particularly if you are a CW buff. Um, as for used QRP transceivers, um, some of them are, um, there are some dedicated QRP rigs used. Uh, you'll probably see some uh, FT817s, 818s on the used market if people upgrade to the ICOM. So that's something to consider. Um, I probably, I'd be careful that some of the early FT817s, the non-ND model, had issues with the final amplifier stage. Um, you can tell the difference between an 817 and an 817 ND. The 817ND has got more colors on the display. I think it's got three colors instead of two, the 817. Um, so there, are, there, there might be one or two other little things, but um, yeah, the ICOM 703 is quite a bit bigger and bulkier than the 817. 160 to six meters only, um, 10 watts output, but um, if you can get one at a good price, um, especially if you're operating QRP from home or a vehicle uh, or a holiday house, then an ICOM 703 would be great. Uh, wouldn't be so good for a mountain top because it does draw a bit more current than the FT817 and it's a bit heavier and bulkier. And even more bulky, even heavier, is the old FT7, um, 10 watts output. The main thing about it, um, it doesn't have all amateur bands. Um, it's only got five bands on HF. It doesn't have 30, 17, 12, 160 meters. Um, and it is bulky and heavy, but it's got a good receiver, analog dial. And if you're into nostalgia, a lot of people started with the FT817. It's a uh, 
it's a very bare bones basic QRP rig, but you can have a lot of fun with them. So um, that's something to consider. Um, there's also what I've called semi kit QRP rigs, um, micro bit X, um, which uh, the, the kit from India, I'm not sure if it's current cost. I think it's around $150, but the thing is, it gives you 80 foot to 10 meters, mostly pre assembled um, with some soldering, and you can customize whatever box. Um, if you're after the professional finish, you might steer away from it, but there are things that um, people into um, hacking things have done mods to it. Um, um, they can be sometimes a little bit fiddly to set up, but they're very low cost. And uh, on CW, um, if you're a dedicated CW person, I wouldn't recommend it because they are a bit clunky. Um, can't remember if they've got a side tone in it, but they're not as refined for CW as, as say, a, a Yaser or an Icon or something like that. But but if, if you're SSB, then Micro Bit X is low cost and uh, you can have a lot of fun with it. Um, then there are kits QRP transceivers. Um, I've reviewed a few of these on my YouTube channel. Um, some of them are double sideband, uh, direct conversion, others are super head. Um, and some of the kits come from here in Australia, Oz QRP, which is uh, BK2DOB. Um, have a look at his website. He's got construction manuals for all his kits on there. So they're worth having a look. Um, one of the small ones is called a MDT, which is about two watts output, double sideband on 40 meters. It only covers a limited part of the band because it uses a ceramic resonator. There are modifications you can do to expand the coverage a bit, but you still won't get the full band. Um, another kit for not much more, um, it's, it's a bit bigger, but it does cover the full band. It's got CW and it's got a DVS. Uh, and I would recommend getting this one. It's called the DCT. And uh, another OzQRP design, you can get it for either 80 or 40 meters. And again, I've done a review and a demonstration so uh, on my YouTube channel. So um, that's um, a kit to consider. Um, there's also a more advanced SSB kit. Again, a single band, um, although in this case, it's short form. So you need to be a bit creative with the enclosure. Um, then from overseas, there are the QRP Labs, QCX, um, a CW transceiver, single band, and it's also got a whisper function um, and, and very low cost. In fact, if you're into, um, um, as well as QRP CW digital modes, have a look at the QRP Labs website. They have a lot of their instruction manuals and it's a very low price. So I don't think he makes much money from them, but uh, um, they are worth, um, uh, investigating um, and some of the modules might be useful if you're into building bits and pieces um, like phasing SSB and whatever. I saw some of his modules um, very cheaply. Um, then there's some other kits um, like you sometimes see them on eBay for $5 or $10 um, like the Pixie or the Frog sounds. Um, that's probably what it really does sound like. Um, but yeah, um, they are crystal controlled 7 megahertz CW very much novelty type kits. Um, if you wanted, if you weren't very ex experienced in building and wanted a very cheap kit that you just wanted to get some experience in soldering before moving on to the more expensive kits, I'd recommend it. Um, but the overall performance isn't great. Um, it's uh, and it's also crystal locked. And if you're crystal controlled, you are very restricted. You basically have to be calling CQ potentially up to an hour or more and be hoping that other people will find your weak signal amongst the noise in the QRM. You can't find people on their frequency. So your chance of getting contacts with the Pixie are much more restricted than with a frequency agile transceiver. And the receiver isn't so good. The output power is low. So um, consider it a novelty um, or as practice for solving. But Otherwise, um, I'd recommend some of the other kits instead. Um, another thing that's quite new um, is that digital modes, um, FT8, of course, and there's also JS8. Um, um, JS8 is something I'd definitely recommend. Um, it's a bit of a mix between FT8, it's a very impersonal mode where you might have an exchange, um, you might exchange basically a signal to noise ratio report, but not much of a chat. Whereas, JS8 
reminds me a bit of slow speed CW, and it does go at about that speed of around nine or 12 words a minute. Um, but it's more a keyboard conversational mode. So you can have proper keyboard chats to people on it. Um, it's not as uh, busy, not as popular as FT8, but particularly on 40 meters, there is a local group, um, VKs that, uh, that use it. And you can do things like uh, send messages to people and get signal reports from other stations and relay through other stations. So it's a bit of a marriage between FT8, PSK31, packet radio and slow speed CW. It's quite an interesting mode. But anyway, um, you can get some QRP kits that do those modes and um, it's more efficient than SSB. So you can work quite long distances even with uh, a watt or so. Um, there's two main kits you can get from overseas. Um, one of them is a double sideband digital transceiver um, where of course you've got two sidebands um, so you're spreading your transmission out a bit and it's less selective on receive. That's a bit simpler. Or there's a digital mode transceiver that uses the phasing technique. So it's true SSB single signal reception. So um, that's probably the better kit and it's not much here. Um, so um, yeah, that's something to consider. And especially if you are a bit limited with antenna space, then digital modes, you can get some great results with, with QRP. And I've also built um, QRP um, direct conversion gear from scratch using FT8 and JSA. And it's really simple and uh, something I really recommend for the results you get. Um, and speaking of home brew, um, um, there are things you can do to maximize your chance of success. Um, I suggest yeah, not too complex, but not ridiculously simple either, like the Pixie is one extreme of being too simple. And in some ways, because it combines the direct conversion receivers detector in with the final amplifier for the transmitter, it's actually the one transistor that does it, it's actually more complex um, and it's much harder to troubleshoot than if you had your receiver in your transmitter in separate stages. So um, there's a few minimum requirements. I really suggest you should be frequency agile, um, particularly in Australia. Um, so you can find people, call them and make contacts. That's one of the easiest ways to make contacts with, with QRP is to find people and call them. Um, then uh, I think you need more than a couple of watts output to maximize your chance of success and a reasonably good direct conversion receiver, one that doesn't overload on the nearest AM broadcast station. Um, one rig that I've built, which I've called the Beach 40, is um, double sideband on 40 meters. And I've worked into VK6 and ZL, so I've had some great contacts on it. Um, and it's very simple. It's only seven or eight transistors. And um, you can buy pretty much all the parts from JCAR, except for the um, ceramic resonator on seven megahertz. Um, there are suppliers from that um, um, VK5 EME kit sell them. Let me know if, if you have problems getting them as, if I've got a few spares. But with a ceramic resonator, you can cover about 150 kilohertz section of the 40 meter band. So it is frequency agile over a very useful part of the um, SSB end of the band. So definitely uh, recommended. Um, there's a bit of a, a joy with, um, with home brew is that um, the serendipity, you can have opportunities with crystals that you can buy cheaply. For instance, um, as it happens, you can you know, walk into JCAR um, or a mail order them. And I'll talk about a special offer with JCAR later on um, for people in VK3. Um, but anyway, you can buy a crystal from them for 3.579 megahertz, uh, near enough to 3.58 megahertz. And that in the 80 meter band, that happens to be the frequency used for JS8. Um, it's actually um, one and a half kilohertz below, but you can pull that crystal, uh, especially if you have two of them, down to that frequency, and you can then form a very basic direct conversion receiver for receiving JS8 signals, and then add a few more parts and build a transceiver, double sideband JS8, so you can have keyboard chats on 80 meters up to several hundred kilometers um, on 80 meters. Um, it's not as much activity on 80 as there is on 40, but this is a potential, very simple, very cheap project 
that will get you going with homebrew QRP in the digital modes. And there's also a supplier from the States who is selling quite cheaply crystals for seven megahertz FT8 and JS8 frequencies. Um, in fact, so I've got his um, W6OUT. I've done a review of his crystals on my YouTube channel. So I, I talk about using those. Um, so having talked about various transceivers, commercial kit homebrew, batteries. Um, some QRP rigs have internal batteries or space for them. Personally, even if the rig has such a space, I don't use it. I normally use external batteries. Um, sealed lead acid is cheap, like seven amp hour, 12 volts. Um, you know, they're like $20 or something. So on a dollars per amp hour, they're the best value, but they are heavy. And if you're into lightweight SOTA or, uh, or portable operating, even pedestrian mobile, they can get a bit tired. So uh, you might want to pay a bit more money and have a lighter battery. Um, NICAD batteries are okay. Nickel metal hydride, a bit more current capacity. Um, they're okay. In fact, there are some batteries I bought from IKEA. They were low self discharge nickel metal hydride batteries. Um, they, um, um, now, because of the way the screen is, um, um, probably can't see it, but anyway, it's Ladder brand L A D D A. 2450, and I believe they are similar to the Eneloop or the low self discharge type of batteries. And I've had them running an FT817 for I think it's about three hours or so. So um, you could potentially use double A's to run uh, low drain QRP rigs. Um, normally, though, I use a uh, LIFEPO4. Um, and I got it from a place in Ringwood. I think their prices have reduced, but it cost me like $150. Anyway, it only weighs about a kilogram. It's been, um, a, a, it's 12 volt, seven amp hour, or eight amp hour, something like that. But it's been really reliable. Um, you do need a, a suitable smart charger, but that's, it looks like a gel, a sealed lead acid gel battery, but it's light weightness makes it really good for pedestrian mobile. So. I've spent the extra money and used that as a battery and been very happy. Um, as far as how much battery power you need, it really depends on how much you use in the transceiver. And for that, I suggest drawing up a power budget and that will depend on how much current your transceiver will draw um, and also how much you're going to use it. Um, and as I mentioned before, some transceivers have very high drain on receive. They use more on receive than a QRP transmitter does on transmit. So um there's a uh, um so that's why that's the objection to taking some of the bigger rigs as portable qrp rigs um but anyway if you look at the specs for your transceiver it will say how much current it uses on receive and how much on transmit and you have to think about how much duty cycle you're using on transmit and and apportion the current draw um and as a rough rule of thumb um with a dedicated qrp rig allow just under one hour of operating per amp hour of battery. Um, okay, may, maybe that's um, um, conservative. Maybe you'd go for, um, um, maybe you'd allow, you know, one hour of operating per two amp hours of battery with something like an FT817 or 818 or ICOM 705. But still, that is conservative. So um, roughly one hour operating per and power for your battery capacity. So um, I find most of the time I'm operating portable for say operating sessions of say two to four hours, in which case a seven amp hour battery is more than sufficient. And you can probably get away with you know, maybe only four amp hour. But, I, but some of the internal batteries that rigs like the FT818 have, even though they've increased their battery capacity over um, the previous model, and I think the same goes for the ICOM 705, their amp hour rating is, is not quite enough for me to be comfortable with for some, you know, long term operating. Um, and there is a really good article that was in the March 2020 QST. Um, they've made it available for free. You don't have to be an ARRL member, but there's a good article on batteries, so I'd recommend reading up on that. Um, as far as antennas go, that's uh, a big um, 
reason, big way for you to become successful with QRP. Um, good antennas, sometimes they associate QRP with very poor antennas. People try those and um, surprisingly get poor, not surprisingly, get poor results. Like with QRP, you're already starting backwards and people might be thinking about those little pixie transceivers, a few hundred milliwatts, and then that's difficult at the best of times. And then they, they try and put on a magnetic loop onto it. And they really, um, and if they're an experienced operator as well, you've got these three factors that are failure factors. You are going to struggle with only one of those factors, but if you add all three on them, it's like a cumulative effect and you're not going to have success. So, um, so uh, think about that. You can use pretty much any antenna you like. Um, five watts, 13 dB, two S points below 100 watts. And you can recoup some of that with a good location and a good antenna or being on the air at the right time. Um, um, it's probably easier to talk about because there's so many different types of antennas. Um, antennas to avoid. Um, it's really hard to make an antenna that's much better than a half wave dipole, but very easy to make one that's inferior. So it's probably best to talk about antennas with high inherent losses or antennas that you need to work very hard on to make uh, hard with to make them successful. Um, like there's some types of magnetic loops are in that category and some types of short vertical antennas are in that category. Whereas a basic half wave dipole, um, it will get out you know, tolerably well, even if you make compromises, even if it's not very high off the ground, even if you have to bend its ends around or down somewhat, like people say, Oh, my yard isn't um, isn't 40 meters long, therefore I can't fit a full-size dipole for 80 meters. Well, a um, bit of a good news story is that with antennas, you can usually shorten them down to about 70% of their full size and you can get reasonable performance from them. Another thing you can do with wire antennas, you can twist them, turn them somewhat and bend their um, ends and you can still get reasonable performance. Um, another thing I should mention, there's no relation between the cost of your antenna and its performance. In fact, uh, um, expensive bought antennas do have compromises um, for them to cover multiple bands. Um, like there's things like um, the buddy pole, for instance, that's sometimes associated with portable QRP, um, but it does cost quite a bit and there's quite a few bits that you need to fiddle around with to set it up, especially if you want to change bands. So, um, it is versatile if you want to experiment with different configurations like horizontal dipoles or verticals or whatever. But otherwise, I don't think it's particularly good value for money. Um, just an NPED wire would be, I think, better. Um, dipoles shorter than three eighths of a wavelength, um, even if tuned feeder. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, you can take about 30% off an antenna's length and still be okay. Like a 80 meter dipole, 40 meters across the top. You go down to a G5RV, 30 metres across the top. That's what I've got here. And my yard is only 20 metres from end to end. So I get away with using that um, with a G5RV by bending its ends down in a bit. So that, that works okay. And, um, uh, but you make it too much smaller and then you start to compromise with your performance. Short end feds and verticals. Um, um, if you've got a... Um, um you can you know you're really starting to compromise with short verticals especially if your ground isn't very good um in feds if you've got half wavelength of wire or even um a three eighths wavelength of wire then that can be tuned up reasonably well um even if you're just using a short counterpoise as a ground when you go a lot smaller than that then attention to ground becomes a lot more of an issue um, and then another thing you should avoid antennas with uh, lots of parts that go hissing. And I mentioned the uh, buddy pole before with various bits, especially if the thunderstorm comes and you're in a hurry, you've got to get out of the place, or it's getting dark and you, um, all the mozzies are approaching and uh, all the tide is coming up. All these sorts of things might force you off the air. Um, and so you want something that is really easy to put up and pack up and uh, if you've got an antenna with a lot of little bits, then that could be a problem. Um, then there's antennas that claim small size, wide bandwidth and high efficiency. Um, yeah, you can have two, but not three. Um, anyone who has designed an antenna with three, um, you know, um, 
I don't think it's happened. There, there have been claims, but uh, yeah, look upon claims with great suspicion. Anything that's too heavy or complex, um, and I put traps and loading coils in, in that, um, although a trapped antenna can be okay for home station antenna, um, but if you want to do multiple bands, um, then there are issues with dipoles with lots of traps. Um, the problem with trapped antennas is that they add greatly to the weight of your antenna. And if you're using an ultralight support, like a telescoping pole that's really floppy in the top section, then you really can't afford to be having much weight on the antenna. And even coaxial cable um, feed line, uh, that can add weight to your station, whereas you could just use an end fed with thin wire, the thinnest type of hookup wire, and save a lot of bulk and space. Um, another thing I'm a bit wary of, um, antennas with resistors for broadband. Um, the resistors will take up some of your power, which you can least afford with QRP. Um, so yeah, um, so that's the things to avoid. Antennas I've used, I've used quite a few. Um, In-fed half wavelength wires and L matches. That's probably the um, simplest go-to antenna I use. You know, about 20 meters wide, doesn't matter, can be a bit longer, can be a bit shorter. Um, arguably, it's the, a little bit less extreme in terms of matching impedances if it's a bit longer than 20 meters, has a half wavelength on 40. Um, you can use a small L match antenna coupler. Um, that easy to build. They just need two components, a coil, which you can wind on a, you know, hook up wire on a toilet roll. That would be okay. Um, as far as a, in a variable capacitor, you can get them from an old AM radio or, and I did a video on this a few days ago, even if you don't have a variable capacitor, you can make your own from pieces of double-sided circuit board material. So um, um, you can just have an alligator clip and circuit board pins and just be having capacitors, capacitances in series and parallel. The idea is that double-sided circuit board material, preferably fiberglass in the middle, um, the better stuff, it forms a capacitance by itself. And I measured, um, I think it was 10 by 15 centimeters. Um, you know, I measured that it was something like 400 picofarad, which is a good maximum for a QRP or an, uh, an L match antenna coupler for 80 meters. Might even be good enough on 160, but anyway, 400 picofarad is a good maximum. So the issue then, my problem was how do you get it variable? And I thought of various things like having two bits of parallel plates that you move the spacing closer and further apart, maybe even make like a giant compression trimmer. But in the end, I just got a hacksaw and sawed off one side of the circuit board um, of the copper um, in exactly half. So then I had two lots of capacitance. One was about 200 picofarad, the other was 200. So you could either have one of them connected up and get 200, or both of them in parallel and get 400. That was fine, but you needed a bit more capacitance range. So I then got the hacksaw out again and sorted it out in half. So I then that choice of 100 or 200 with the two lots connected or the extra 200. And then I sorted it again and again. So there are a total of seven pads of differing sizes each one half the size of the next one. So a bit like binary counting. If you've got some um, um, seven pads of different capacitance values, you can achieve, you know, something like you know, over a hundred different combinations of capacitor. So although that's not quite a variable capacitor as such, if you connect them in parallel, you can achieve a quite a fine range of capacitances, and that can be ideal for an antenna couple. So don't despair if you don't have a variable capacitor, but you still want to build an antenna coupler, you can do it with double-sided printed circuit board. Um, okay, another antenna I've used, um, full wavelength delta loop, beautiful wavelength per side. Um, you can, depending on how, the, how you feed it, you can make that horizontal or vertically polarized. If you're over salt water, make it vertically polarized, um, and that works quite well. Um, you can have an antenna coupler and be able to tune it in on multiple bands. Um, you do need a telescoping pole to support it. Um, another thing, faithful, a lot of used by a lot of people, summits of the air, centre-fed dipole. Um, 
great for a single band. Make it a link dipole with alligator clips and insulators. You can use pieces of chopping board or pe some people even use sections of cable ties. Uh, a link dipole will be efficient. Um, the only problem is you have to lower it down and um, change the taps on it to change bands. But yep, if you're not an ardent DX contesting type station where you are often changing bands, a link dipole is great. Um, traps and loading coils, as I mentioned before, they add bulk and um, and tend to bend your pole over, so possibly not ideal. Shroom feeder dipole is efficient but requires a balanced coupler. Um, and yet you can make your own feed line, but you will get coverage of pretty much all, all the bands. Um, you start off with an antenna length that is, um, it can go, it can be a full-sized half wave length dipole. If you don't quite have that space, it can be 70% of it. Um, but yeah, you can use that with a balanced coupler. And I, I've even used those tuned feeder dipoles with unbalanced couplers and, and they work okay. Um, then there's other types of antennas um, as well. Um, which, which I won't go into here. Um, as far as materials go, um, very different to if you are setting up a station at home. Um, QRP, it's got to be light, portable, easy to put up. So something like portable squid poles, fishing poles, uh, there's a mob in Sydney called Haverford, so um, they've got quite a big range. I normally favour a pole of around eight metres tall um, and uh, you know, eight or nine metres and that can support an in-fed wire like an inverted L quite well. There's other bits and pieces that are worth taking. Velcro straps, um, you might be able to find them in um, uh, $2 shops or order them on eBay, that might be easier at the moment. Um, Velcro strip, um, a, a fishing line, irrigation tubing can be handy for spaces for open wire feed line. Um, thin hookup wire, it's fine for antennas. Um, chopping board and plastic cork loop material. Of course, here in Victoria, we've got council elections at the moment. And of course, there'll be people that will be leaving their cork loops around the place on various fences. So, you know, you never know, you might be able to uh, scavenge some cork loop material and you can chop that up. That is super light and it's also super strong. You could make even antenna insulators. You can put punch holes in them and they can be really um, strong. I, I did a, a test with an Oki strap and I was trying to pull it and um, anyway, the uh, hook on the strap bent out and broke before this cork loop material did. So it's really light, very, very strong. You can use them for antenna insulators and even open wire feed lines. So um, yeah, a few things to avoid. Um, personally, I avoid coax cable, less on HF. Bulky antenna couplers, you don't need them. Bulky BSWR meters, most transceivers have that function in them. Heavy balance, don't need them. Antenna analyzers, um, yeah, uh, generally rely on the indicator in the transceiver. And uh, basically you question every gram, does it add to your signal or not? Even automatic antenna couplers, I don't bother, I just use a manual L match. Um, and as to supporting the antenna, different ways you can do it. Easiest, most common is a uh, squid pole. It's quite light, portable, provided that you can carry something that's, you know, the bigger ones are about a meter tall. Uh, in some cases that can be annoying, um, you know, especially if you've got a backpack and other things, you can get smaller poles that are a bit more fragile, a bit more expensive, but they extend quite tall, but might collapse down to, I don't know, 50 or 60 centimeters, but they might be lighter, so they might be better for backpacking type applications. Um, Another possibility is a, a fishing line or um, and a sinker you can throw over a tree. Probably not very sociable in parks where there's a lot of the public around um, yeah, and you probably don't want to be seen doing that sort of stuff. Um, um, you know, kites and things, I have tried kite antennas with some great success. Um, depends, like if, if there's no wind then it can be a problem. Um, but yeah, uh, it can be really rewarding, 160 meters portable QRP with a kite antenna. But you do really need a large open space and, and safety is important um, um, to avoid your kite landing on the ground and, uh, um, and there being people running into it and whatever. Um, matching the antenna, I've mentioned um, you can have direct kite speed if it's a single band dipole or link dipole. Um, a small L match is what I normally use. Um, a lot of designs on my website um, talk about L matches. And I've mentioned before what you can do if you don't have a variable capacitor. 
Some transceivers have antenna couplers built in, but they may only match a limited impedance range. So they may not be ideal for all antennas. Um, and automatic antenna couplers, um, yeah, I don't see the need for them. Um, and uh, then, of course, I've, okay, so I've spoken about equipment, spoken about antennas. Um, now, next thing is operating and making contacts. And this is where um, people's views on QRP may be based on their previous experience. They can um, vary. Um, some people don't have much success, so they give it up as a bad joke. And uh, of course, if you, you might, you know, they you might be able to get a bargain with an FT818 or whatever, if they sell it, hardly used. Um, uh, after people give up on it, but yeah, um, basic operating techniques, and I talk about this in, in some of my books, um, I'll talk about later on. Uh, tune the band first. First of all, get an idea of general conditions on the band, where it's open to. Take a note of beacons and call sign third. And of course, we're in late October. So um, from about November, December, January, 10 meters will really start to open and we'll start to hear beacons. 28.2 no, to 28.3 is where there'll be beacons and uh, um, and they can give you an idea as to where the band's open to. Um, then um, as well with operating, um, when you're tuning the band, you should get an idea as to you know the stations that are in contact, if the station's calling CQ, if they're about to finish a contact or if they're making very quick contacts, make mental notes of that. Uh, all, they, all those present opportunities to call stations you know are listening. Um, so you sort of categorize, you know, you know you're sort of going, going across the band, categorizing various clusters of activity by the prospects of you being able to get a contact in a reasonable time. Um, like if they're taking an hour or so to be chatting about their tomatoes or whatever, then they'll, they'll probably be going on and on for ages. So just um, spin the dial and and, uh, and consider some other frequencies. Um, but, um, and, uh, and with faster contacts, and you'll be able to, uh, um, there might be some opportunities where they finish with someone, call CQ, or listen, um, or even sign off. Um, best ways to get contacts, um, probably in this order, replying to CQ calls, tail ending. So if someone just finishes a contact, then they're very likely to still be listening on the frequency and a frequency where someone is listening on is far beats a frequency where no one is listening on. So give them a call and you might get some contacts very easily. Um, calling them just after the contact is finished. Timing is sometimes important there because some contacts don't finish very cleanly and there's people that have final time. So a bit of an art to getting that right. Um, then if there are no, no one calling CQ, no one finishing a contact, but you reckon the band's open, call CQ yourself anyway. Um, timing is quite important. Um, put yourself in the clear when you are calling other people. This is particularly an issue where you know, things like SOTA, people have been put up on various clusters, so you might all of a sudden have um, people calling one another. Um, so yeah, timing is really important to make sure that you're being heard, um, especially with QRP where you might be competing with higher power stations. So. You want yourself to be in the clear. Um, now, once contact is established, um, don't make your first over very long. Uh, the important thing is you've got to get the basics across first, um, the call sign, then the signal report. Once you've got that and they've confirmed it right, you've met the requirements for a contact. So anything else after that is just a bonus because there are sometimes contacts you hear where they can go on and on and they can talk about everything, yet they still haven't got the call sign Right, and it's an invalid contact and it wouldn't work in a contest that QSLing will be all wrong. So make sure you get the basics across first. Um, and if you are uncertain about conditions, make sure that they've got a good reception to you and don't give any information until they've got your call sign correct um, and, and, uh, and keep persisting until they do. Um, now I mentioned before, frequency agility is king. You must find and call people rather than expecting them to find you if your signal is weak. That's why crystal control can be a problem um, because you're stuck. Um, as to current conditions, are they that bad? Um, more than 300, 3,000 kilometers DX, that seems to be the point where it's difficult um, for QRP. Um, but you can still work DX longer distance than that with digital modes. 
Um, you can still use grey line on the lower HF bands. Get up early in the morning and try 40 metres um, or in the evening around sunset, again, 40 metres a possibility. Um, you can still easily work up to 3,000 kilometres on 80 through to 20 metres with um, QRP. If I mentioned before, summer's coming up, so great opportunities on 10 and 6 metres. And of course, there's also VHF, UHF microwaves where um, um, you know, even 100 or 200 kilometre contact is quite an achievement. So, and, and, and people can do that with milliwatts. So you've got some great um, kilometres per watt um, ratio there. Um, uh, HF pedestrian mobile, um, with the uh, easing of lockdown restrictions so we can go out a bit more, especially for our exercise. Um, HF pedestrian mobile is, uh, um, will be good, particularly as we come up to the summer and the better conditions. Um, for overall, 40 metres is about the best span for HF pedestrian mobile. Uh, quite a lot of activity. Uh, quite a bit of that activity is summit to the air people, um, people in national parks that have very low noise receiving environments, so they'll be able to hear you okay. So 40 metres is a great band for pedestrian mobile, um, despite the antenna being somewhat inefficient. Um, 20 and 30 metres can be good. Um, but skip distances can be quite long on that. Um, 30 metres, not so much SSB, though we in Australia can use SSB on 30 metres, not so much activity. Um, although, if when the sunspots pick up, um, 30 metres will become the perfect band for between Sydney and Melbourne. At the moment, 40 metres is probably still the best, but as the conditions improve, 30 will, will come into its own for that sort of distance. Uh, for 20 metres, it's contacts like VK6, VK4, and ZL. Um, but um, when conditions improve, again, you'll have northern New South Wales and even Sydney coming through on 20 metres. But I find 20 metres is more DX oriented. And if you're just to go out on a nice day randomly and make contacts with pedestrian mobile, you're almost certain to do it on 40 metres, less so on the other bands. 80 metres is very difficult, but possible. Uh, need to, to do some more work with antennas. There can be times when 40 metres isn't so good with your close range stations, like two or 300 kilometres. And even if your antenna is severely compromised, you can still make contact on 80 metres. Um, 10 metres can be great. Um, summer sporadic E season, six metres great. Um, it really do, it does help if you've got access to 50 megahertz because that's where most of the activity is. And two metres, 70 centimetres SSB. Um, there's actually activity nets and most evenings of the week on two metres SSB. Um, some of them are even vertically polarised net. Like there's a net on Wednesday evening, 144, 150. There's a new Tasmanian net on Thursday nights on two metres SSB. You might be able to hear them when conditions are good. Um, there's a 70 centimetre SSB net. Um, on one, I think Monday or Tuesday, I think there's another Tuesday or Monday net on two metres SSB. So, uh, and early Saturdays and Sunday mornings around 7.30, 8 a.m., there's activity on two metres SSB. So most days of the week, particularly in the summer, if you pick your time right, you might be able to get some contacts. Um, another great thing about pedestrian mobile is that you can get some questions from passers-by. Um, as far as antennas for pedestrian mobile, there's two, or you could argue three main choices. Um, either a magnetic loop, good for on the land. It doesn't foul power lines because it's not too tall. It's good at knowing out local noise and interference. Um, and a 90 centimetre loop, which is my bigger loop, covers seven through to 28 megahertz. And you can make it out of a three metre piece of aluminium that you can buy from Bunnings. Um, a 40 centimetre loop, uh, a lot more easier, easier to carry. 21 through to 50 megahertz. That's my favorite antenna for pedestrian mobile on six and 10 meters. Um, vertical, uh, other option is a vertical antenna. Um, I just use five meters of wire on a fishing pole. Um, it's supported on a backpack. I've got a chopping board inside that backpack and that's got some plastic pipe and that's where I slide the fishing pole in. And um, the five meters is great because you can buy quite compact fishing poles a bit over five meters long and a five meter long vertical wire will work quite efficiently above about 10 megahertz um it's 30 meters it's about a sixth of a wavelength so 
Uh, it's not quite your full size corner of the wavelength, but it's still quite efficient. For 40 meters, you can get it to operate efficiently if you put a loading coil in the middle. Um, so you've got to send a loaded um, vertical. And I, I do that and I have a switch. So on bands from 10 through to um, 30 megahertz, I have the loading coil switched out. On 7 megahertz, I have it switched in. You know, with a small LMATCH antenna coupler, that can cover you know, 10 through to 50 megahertz. So I've used it on six meters and, and uh, of course down to 40 meters with the loading core. And if you're over water, especially if you're standing in the water, then it works really well. Um, so I've had, I've, I've worked into Europe occasionally on, on that when conditions were better. Um, so to summarize, QRP works with all facets of amateur radio. The equipment is plentiful and cheap. Operating technique's really important. And there's a lot of um, activity and variety of activities so even during a low sunspot year there's still stuff you can do um, further information i really recommend joining the vk qrp club um, they put out a magazine called uh, the camera's not showing it very well but it's called low key and um the um and, and that's um you know 15 dollars a year membership get four issues of low key a year so some uh, good stuff in there um, also, my website, vk3ya.com, um, just in the last few weeks, I've added a lot more items to my website. So even if you've seen it before, it's worth having another look. Um, there's a, a much bigger technical session uh, section, a lot more articles on antennas and, uh, and, and projects. So uh, my website has a lot of information on QRP. And then there's various books I've written. Um, they are quite big sellers, something like 10,000 have been sold worldwide. I, I've lost count. Um, but minimum QRP uh, covers pretty much a lot of what I've spoken about tonight, but in probably a bit more detail, particularly in the operating aspects um, and antennas. Um, and then there's hand-carried QRP antennas, um, more antennas for pedestrian, mobile and portable, really light antennas, and then another volume called more hand-carried QRP antennas. So those three books, you can get them as e-books or um, you can, um, or from overseas, you can order them as, as paperbacks through Amazon overseas. So uh, I had a look at the reviews. Um, they are books that have been quite popular. Uh, another thing I mentioned um, is that uh, another um, the, the JCAR special offer at the moment, um, Australian Ham Radio Handbook. Now, this is the book that pretty much every VK amateur should have. It's, um, you know, we don't have the AWRL handbook or the RSVB, but we do have this. And it's all locally sourced information, basically an operating guide for amateur radio in VK. So it's very detailed, it talks about the various modes, the various activities. Um, if, you've, if you've just got a foundation license, it, it's, um, you know, it's over 100 pages or, you know, 140 pages. And it's uh, way more than the foundation license manual. The foundation license manual is good at telling you what you need to know to pass the foundation license exam. There's Ron Bertrand's book, which is great for the theory, but this book is, is more for the operating aspects of amateur radio. And it talks about what you need to do to set up a station. Um, it talks about antennas and the choice of equipment and, and operating as well. So um, if you've just got your foundation license or even if you are returning to amateur radio, um, then um, yeah, it's Australia's own amateur radio handbook. And you can buy it from um, as an ebook from Amazon if you're into ebooks or the paperback book is um, you can get them from JCAR shops. Now, JCAR have a special offer at the moment. Um, and if you're thinking about various bits and pieces, now could be a good time to be making an order. This is for people only in VK3. But if, if you order $30 worth or more, then their delivery is free. So, um, you know, their delivery, you might pay, I don't know, five or $10 or whatever it is. But order $30 and it's free. So the book is $24.95. So that gets you nearly there. Just order a few more other bits and pieces and that you'll get free delivery. So that's that's something that could be worth considering. Anyway, that's the um, end of the presentation. Uh, we've got uh, plenty of time for questions. So, uh, yep, we'll... Uh, um, um, Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. It's uh, a, an excellent job. Um,
I hope you got a good glass of uh, something refre refreshing there to wet your throat with, mate. Yeah. yeah. Um, what we'll do, we'll throw it open to the floor. Um, just so Peter, if he needs to refer back to you at another stage, first first time in, just introduce yourself with your first name and your call, please, just so Peter can make a reference if he has to follow up with something you bring up. So I'll throw it open to the floor, just unmute when you're ready to talk and um, please mute after you've finished again. Thank you. I've got a question. Um, uh, hi, Peter. Uh, I'll put it in the chat. Um, I, I've moved to a house and I've got a lot of um, uh, noise. Uh, it looks like switching power supplies. Uh, and I think it's the neighbor who's got some power tools. I suspect it whenever he's doing some soaring and things. Is there anything I can do? Um, can I, uh, apart from going down to the water, can, uh, is there anything with antennas or, or have you tried noise cancelling? Does that, does that sort of stuff work? Yeah, yeah. There's a um, couple of things um, there. First of all, um, it's starting point is that uh, unplug everything, turn everything off and just have battery powered rig and um, and see if the noise is quieter. If it is quieter, then there's obviously something, uh, an issue with something in your own house. And as far as dive, and then gradually turn things on and try and locate the source of noise and, and where it's coming from. Um, now there's a, a website called QRM Guru that has a lot of information and there's some tutorial videos. And basically their thing is, putting ferrites all over, you know, you know, things like switch mode power supplies, monitors, uh, modem connections, there's all sorts of places and interference can come from things that you'd never suspect. There's cases that even a shaver that's plugged in to a power uh, and not turned on, even that can cause interference. Um, and thing, um, so yeah, um, it's very much a forensic approach of going through everything that's electronic in your house that can cause interference not just turn everything off, unplug everything and remove all the power because you never know where interference can come from. And once you've given your own house a clean bill of health, the, there's another approach. Um, and I know, I think that Grand VK5GR has been done some, done some experiments with that, but there's also uh, a noise canceller on Lloyd Butler's VK5VR website. And the idea there is that you have a sense antenna and your main receiving antenna. And with this noise canceller thing, you basically combine signals from the two antennas. You've got your sense antenna is designed to pick up lots of noise. And then you use um, RF phase shift networks to try and adjust levels and phasing. So with any luck, you're able to reduce noise levels by um, using phasing techniques to null out the opposing noise and that I believe people have had quite good success with that. Another possible approach is separate transmit and receive antennas um, because there's a big difference between because people assume that an antenna that's good on transmit will be good on receive and that's not necessarily the case because an antenna that's good on transmit it needs to be efficient. It needs to radiate almost all your signal um, that's applied to it and preferably with some gain and directivity. Whereas with receive antennas, it's um, a good receive antenna is not the antenna that provides the most signal to the receiver. It's the one that provides the best signal to noise ratio to the receiver. So if you've got something like a small magnetic loop, then potentially you could um, set that up so that you've got it operating as a receive antenna. And a lot of 160 meter people um, you know, DX is particularly might be having, say, a beverage antenna. It's, you know, a long wire antenna running along the fence. This is only if they've got a lot of space. Uh, no good for transmit, but it can be good for receive and then have a vertical antenna for transmit. Um, if you don't have the space for a beverage antenna, you could make something with ferrite rods and windings and make it like an AM radio that's directional with a bit of null. Um, you could even try a, a loop type antenna with an RF preamp and, and put it and, and move it around the backyard and see where there's the least noise and try and null things out. 
Um, and that's one particular project that um, you know, a lot of HF transceivers only have a single antenna socket. And really, that's a mistake. They should really have two or three or more. They should have in a standard a thing so that you can, if you want, select an antenna that's a separate receiving antenna and a separate transmitting antenna. But fortunately, if, if your rig only has one antenna socket, most transceivers have an accessory socket where you can take out the push to talk line or something from that socket and you can put in a small relay and you can have that switching a little external switch box and have it so that you've got your transmit antenna on transmit and on receive the thing automatically goes to a separate receive antenna so that's a really cheap simple project if you want to try multiple antennas for noise and you'd also want to have a little switch on that switch box so you can override it so you can try seeing how the transmit antenna goes on receive and flipping over to so you can do an a b comparison so yeah that that's pretty much um all i can suggest um track down interference have a look at resources like qrm guru and also um um consider receive antennas Thanks, Peter. That's great. I, I did turn the, the power off in our house and it's not our house. So uh, it's coming from a neighbour somewhere. Thanks. Next next question, please. Who else wants to add to the meeting tonight, please? Yes, uh, Peter, Mike Adams, BK3 KMA. Good evening. Well done with your uh, presentation, Peter. Um, question. Uh, in your book, you've got the hexagon flat aluminium um, loop. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't got a photo of you up there, actually, Peter. I don't know where you've gone. Um, we, how did you work out the dimensions? Okay, well, there's various loop antenna calculators, um, but um, because a loop can either be too big or can be too small. Um, when, when it's too big, it stops behaving like a magnetic loop. And when it's too small, it becomes inefficient. Um, in the case of my um, smaller loop, oh, um, it's general, you can generally cover about a three to one frequency ratio in magnetic loops. Um, you can... Um, um, you know, maybe if, if you connect some extra parallel capacitances, you can get a four to one ratio or a bit more, but your efficiency start, starts to drop off at the bottom end. So, um, yeah, there are online loop, mag the magnetic, online magnetic loop calculators, and they will tell you how big the diameter needs to be and how much capacitance. Um, basically, trial and error. Like in my case, a 40 centimeter diameter loop. Um, and also, so, um, you should you also the dimensions. If you've got a variable capacitor for the loop, then that the dimensions of the loop might be dependent on what capacitance range your capacitor covers. Um, like for my um, twenty or for my uh, twenty-eight to fifty megahertz loop, that's about forty centimeters in diameter. I use a Beehive trimmer capacitor, which goes up to I think it's up to. 50 picofarad with that one. So I was very restricted with the loop size. Um, the trimmer is almost all the way out when on six meters. If the loop was any bigger, it, I wouldn't be able to tune it in on 50 megahertz. And then the trimmer is almost all the way in on 28 megahertz. Or I think it actually goes down to 24 or 21. But um, yeah, so it, the loop is basically a tuned circuit and whatever resonates with your trimmer within certain parameters as to the efficiency. Um, and then, of course, uh, um, a bigger loop, like a 90 centimeter loop, is okay. It's technically probably slightly too big for 28 megahertz, but I still get good results there. Um, 90 centimeters is a good size for, say, 14, 21 megahertz, um, but with a bit of extra capacitance down to 10 megahertz and even 7 megahertz. So down there, the frequency drops. But I wanted the loop to cover 7 to 28 megahertz. So 90 centimetres, which happens to coincide with three metres of um, the black aluminium from Bunnings, was a good size. If you wanted to do 80 metres, then you would definitely be sacrificing some frequency coverage at the top end. So you might just do 80 metres through to 30 metres. And for a loop, 
Ideally, it should be maybe two, two metres in diameter for that. Um, you can probably get away with 1.5 metres. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's loop, and loop calculators and also based on what capacities you have um, and your resonant frequency. Is that the, uh, the loop calculator? Is that the, giving you the distance between each bend? Um, to form the loop? <laughs> so the loop calculator will normally give you things like the frequency range the loop will cover, the efficiency and the capacity you need. Yeah, but what I was after was the actual, um, from your bending of well, the loop. It's, uh, um, well, it's a hexagon, so the sides are all, it, it really doesn't matter whether it's a circular loop or whether it's a... Yeah, hexagon. I understand that. The reason I'm asking that is I've got probably 10, 15 strips of uh, flat aluminium, mm. um, about three and a half metres long. Okay, well, okay. Mm. An important consideration is to minimise resistive loss. So the first thing I would... Okay, so you're three and a half metres long. That by itself is is similar to my bigger loop that I had pictured, and that will work um, very well on 10 through to 21 megahertz and, you know, reasonably well on 28 megahertz and okay on oh, 7 megahertz, but ideally it should be a bigger size. Uh, if you want to get a bigger range of frequencies, you're probably better off with two loops. And if you were to try, um, I, I did build ages ago, um, a loop for 80 metres. And if you had two of those strips, so you had six metres worth of loop, you could build a loop. If you had two of those strips, um, let's say, um, it, it might be an issue having it supporting itself, self-supporting, unless you might have to build a timber brace or something, that, that's fine. Um, and that could also provide support for your variable capacitor at the top. Um, but yeah, if you had two of those strips, so six metres wide, that would be good for 80 metres and 40 metres. Um, it would probably be slightly too big for 20 metres and definitely too big for 10 metres. Um, but yeah, it depends on the capacitance value you know, of the capacitor. And, and that's a consideration. Like if you're going to use, be using a loop for high power, 100 watts, you know, people use uh, Russian vacuum variable capacitors. That will increase the cost but it's worthwhile. And the other issue, of course, if you're using more than one strip is the electrical contact between the two strips. It needs to be really clean and, and bolted together really well to minimize yeah. the loss. Um, and you know, some people would rather a single larger strip or even copper, like you can buy annealed copper from <coughs> Bunnings that you could use instead. Yeah, um, but the main, 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 the main, thing I'm trying to get at is you've got a one point, say for argument's sake, 1.5 diameter. How did you calculate the angles and the length of material between? Well, if you're going to have a hexagon, the, the angles will be the same geometry, whether it's big or small. Um, like, um, I can't remember if it's a hexagon or if it's an octagon, like a stop sign. Anyway, um, well, you just, um, you know, you can, uh, as far as calculating angles, yeah, I, I just, um, uh, this particular, the, the aluminium, the flat aluminium I used was, um, I think about three to five millimeters in diameter. And that was thick enough for me to bend with just a bit of wood um, and and, um, uh, and just by, by my weight leaning on it and just bending it, bringing it up. So um, yeah, there's, I, I don't know what, angle it is for a hexagon or octagon but you know um yeah. it's standard no matter its size it's the same angle it's the same shape so actually did you did you aim for a particular size overall and did you draw it up on the ground to to get the angles well um i've just sort of experimented you know known that a certain size would work for certain frequencies and and, the, and there's calculator websites that will tell you all you need to know for um, you, you, you punch in frequencies and the amount of um, material you've got and it will tell you the loop efficiency and it will tell you things like the uh, um, capacitance so 
there's calculators that can do all that automatically online. Okay, thanks, Peter. Next, uh, next one. Jeff VK three LZ. I see you had your hand up. I hope you're asking. I've got a question there. Have you? You've muted. You're muted, mate. You're on mute. I, I was just going to say that the angle of the individual hexagon sides would be 360 divided by the number of sides. So if it was um, an octagon, it'd be 360 divided by eight at each individual angle. That's all I was going to say. Uh, it, I, it'd be a bit, bit more than that, wouldn't it? It'd be like, an, it'd need to be an obtuse angle for it to... Um, um... Well, the, the sum of the total angles around the side has to equal 360, doesn't it? 360, yeah. Um, 135 then, degrees well, on each internal angle. Square, certainly for a square, um, you know, 90 degrees by four, now, in, in sync, I'm, so, making a, I'm making a basic maths mistake here, aren't I? Sorry. So I'm just, just thinking, now, uh, it's interesting to work this out. So, so, certainly for a square, yet yeah, 90 degrees. Um, for an equilateral triangle, I think from memory, it's 60 degrees. So that adds up to 180. So I think as you go from a um, yeah, sorry, I triangle know adds I'm... up to 180, square yeah. adds up to 360, and then hexagons yeah. and octagons add up to 600. Oh, sorry. Yeah, my, my bad. I'm sorry. That, yeah. That's all right. But it's, it's a good brain teaser. <laughs> Peter, VK3 uh, PF, you have unmuted. You got, you got a question for us? Uh, I was just going to comment that it's probably a uh, quick, quick in the head at calculation. Each bend would be a angle would be 120 degrees for a hexagon and uh, probably 135 for an octagon. But I, I, again, I could be wrong. <laughs> well, the the reason I ask that question is uh, part of my uh, part of my workload was um, a steel bender. Oh yeah, and I used to have to bend all these sorts of different angles and all that sort of thing. And because there's no dimensions in the uh, in your book, um, I was just wondering how, what how you worked out your your flat bit on the side to the angle for your top bit and all that sort of stuff. What we used to do was to uh, say we wanted a, um, uh, say, uh, 1.8. We'd, we'd draw up a 1.8 square on the floor at work and then working work the sizes that way. Because most times the, the, the uh, scheduler or draftsman would put a figure in there and it wouldn't, wouldn't calculate. So yeah. uh, we had to actually do it physically on the floor. Yeah, well, I, I sort of like, I did it sort of physically on like like first of all I marked where I wanted the bends, um, you know, the, the six bends or whatever with a pencil, and then um, um, bent it obviously to less than required. Like it's you know you, you don't want to overbend this, um, yeah. and especially if you bend backwards and forwards, you um, reduce its strength. So yeah, just sort of bent. Um, Less and then, you know, gradually worked around until um, the things met at the bottom, um, basically. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Mike. Who's our next questioner, please? Come on, got to have, we've got to have somebody out there who's got something of interest. Richard, you've always got something to ask. Well, good evening, BK3. Uh... FP slash KVK. Yeah, look, I don't really have anything to say, to be honest. Uh, it was quite interesting, of course. Um, I certainly have done QRP contacts and uh, it's good fun. But yeah, now, look, I'm, I'm all good. Uh, so, yeah. No worries. Um, who else have we got this? What about Lucinda? You got a question, Lucinda? You muted? No, I'm, 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 I'm good, thanks, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> don't, oh, my don't, don't torture her, Mike. Don't torture her. I'll find out tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, there's probably too many questions for the amount of time we have, so, yeah. <laughs> Just to fill those people in that aren't part of the club, uh, Mike's been jittering Lucinda for her F call, so uh, um, he's actually... I should get, give him a bit of a smackdown because he's basically uh, t taking the the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> Mickey out of it on the call here. Michael, you cruel man. 
<laughs> anyway, on the more serious notes, next, anybody else want to raise a question? Peter Marks, go ahead. Uh, and then Peter Freeman, in that order. I, I'll go for a second one. Um, uh, Peter, I, I've been following, uh, I think you might have as well, the micro SDX, this mm. new software-defined um, QRP radio. It looks like the dawning of a new age of, uh, of small transceivers where there's a CPU that does all the work and, and not much circuitry apart from that. What do, you, what do you think? Do you think this is a stepping stone or are we really uh, in a new age or do you think these things are fatally flawed? Oh, I don't know enough about them, but it does look promising. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, I think there have been, um, from what I've read, the quality of SSB is not quite up to the standards that we'd expect, but it can only get better, but, you know, it's like this early versions of almost anything. So, yeah, you know, it's quite possible that we'll have these very simple things that just require uh, a power amplifier chain to be connected up to and uh, will give you DC to daylight coverage. I've, I've got the parts and I've, I've ordered the board, uh, so uh, we'll see. But it looks interesting. Like anything with software, it can get better uh, over time just with software flashes. So uh, I was going to say, now I'm going to look at the commercial radios and they've got quite good performance with software-defined radios, haven't they? Mm. So it is possible. I also looked up um, the angles here too. So I think for a hexagon it's 120 degrees and for an octagon it's 135 degrees. Oh, so my best was up there. No, yeah, for every time you add 180 degrees is the, is the rule. So if I've got three sides, it's 180. If I've got four sides, it's 360. If I've got five sides, it's 540 and so on. Fair enough. Hmm. Okay, ne next person. Thanks, John. Hmm. Peter, go for it. Um, yeah, look, I've had lots of experiences. I'm sure uh, some of the others on, on the channel have, have as well. Um, I reinforced Peter's comments that um, number one place to look still on your, video. is your antenna efficiency. Yeah. And um, uh, we, we, did you we've got Michael talking on the phone and he's not muted. Um, I've, I've just muted him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Michael, but um, it was distracting. Um, look, I I started off using uh, link dipoles, uh, particularly for SOTA, but also for parks activations. Um, and of course, SOTA is usually QRP. Um, but of late, because of the benefit of the inbuilt ATU unit in the KX2, uh, I've been using a ZS6 BKW doublet. And the advantage I find there is that uh, one can uh, just rapidly change bands and hit the tune button without having to pull down the squid pole and open, open or close loops or uh, uh, links on the link dipole. So, uh, and there's all sorts of stuff that's been around in the way of um, different variations on Q QRP radios. And Peter's comments are by and large uh, right in the ballpark uh, as usual, as one would expect. Um, and um, uh, th there was one that I thought some, some of the group may not have seen, which is, uh, has been a bit of a disappointment because although it had all sorts of great promises as a QRP transceiver, uh, the software development fell through. So it didn't really happen, but there it is. Um, oh, which was that one? Um, that's the uh, PSDR. Your, back, your background's killing it out, Peter. Yeah, okay, let, let, give me a sec. Just turn your background up for a sec. And, um, and We'll go to there. Yep. So that gives you an idea of the size. Yeah. It's probably only a couple hundred milliwatts output, but 
uh, and the battery hasn't been charged for, but that includes a battery and the CW panel. Uh, it's got a couple of flaws, but as I said, the big problem was that software development didn't happen. So I've got a paperweight. <laughs> so is it still operational even in the current less developed form? Um, sort <coughs> of, Peter. I've, I've never really tried it. Um, I've received with it. I've never tried to transmit. Um, yeah, it's, it was a great project uh, with great promise, but it just never came through. But anyway, there's lots of things that show up as, um, as projects. And there's been a number of clones of the MCHF project. Oh, yes, yeah. Um, including Chinese copies. Mm. Uh, so there's lots of choices out there. So the, the thing that I'd recommend is that people consider carefully what their needs are, read the reviews, look at the availability, uh, because there's um, there's a there's a lot of things that show up that are advertised, and they never really um, are produced as a finished product on the market. Uh, so there's a whole ho host of transceivers out of China that are just variations on the MCHF at various prices. But the problem is that Chris, the original developer of the MCHF, is just being ripped off by all these Chinese companies. Mm. But getting back to the fundamental point, antenna efficiency is king if you're running low power. Mm. Yeah, it's a pity, no. Sorry, it's a pity <laughs> that radio didn't take off, Peter. I remember you showing me that at uh, the uh, Hamfest and uh, Peninsula back in what was it 2017, I think. Oh. So, yeah, something like that 2017 or 2018. Yeah, and, and there's just been, yeah, the, the guy produced the units as he promised on the, the, um, the Kickstarter project. But the software development stopped and it, it just, I mean, I haven't had the time or the inclination to, to try to follow up. I've checked occasionally and no one's really come up with um, software upgrades for it. It's a pity. All right, next person, please. Can I just ask, Peter, what was the name of the QRP antenna we used as again? You, you, you rattled it off fairly quickly. I just didn't. A QRP antenna. Um, lots of different, like there's mag I've spoken about magnetic, magnetic loops, dipoles, verticals. Which, which antenna? Um, I was actually referring to Peter Freeman, actually. So. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, um, I started off using just um, multi band link dipole. Yeah. Um, but of late, I've been using a ZS6, a BKW, which is a doublet. It's a refinement on the G5RV. Uh, but you do need an antenna tuner. And uh, for uh, particularly for SOTA expeditions where I've got a bit of a walk involved, I, I use the KX2 with an inbuilt ATU in the transceiver. Where will so, I find information on the thing? Um, just do a search for ZS6 BKW. It's, it's ZS very common. Lots of people have built them. Have they? ZS6 BKW, is it? Yeah, and there's a there's a particular article um, ZS6 BKW from the horse's mouth. Okay. Yeah, Ray is actually using one, uh, John. Okay. He is using uh, this one. So it's, in it. it's roughly of the order of about 23, 24 metres across the top. Yeah. Um, perhaps a little bit longer. It depends on the feed line you're using. Mm. It uses a balanced line. So you either need uh, 450 or 300 ohm ribbon to feed it. And depending upon the length of the doublet that you use at the top, um, will will influence the length of the feed line that you need. 
uh, and then in, in ideally you want a one-to-one -one balance at the bottom if you're going into coax uh, and then to an unbalanced ATU or you could use the balanced ATU. So the configuration that I'm using is um, um, the doublet on the top, some 300 arm TV ribbon uh, to some uh, RJ316 coax, so it's Teflon coax, about three millimeters diameter, uh, with several uh, windings of the coax through a ferrite choke to make a um, a one to one ish ballon uh, into a BNC connector onto the radio with the inbuilt ATU on the, on the radio, and it, it's just it's just really great. It you know, it can the, I can have it up anywhere between six or seven meters at the apex in an inverted V configuration to 10 or uh, 14 meters up in the air uh, and um, just plug it onto the radio and hit the tune button on the KX2 and, it, and the radio will usually tune it up and get a respectable match and I'll make contacts. It's um, uh, relatively lightweight, the one that I'm using, I'm using one millimeter multi-stranded stainless steel wire for the uh, each half of the doublet and some old solid 300 ohm TV ribbon for the for the balance feed line. Uh, so it's just what I've been using of late. I've got a bigger version that is um, three millimeter multi-stranded stainless for the doublet and 450 ohm uh, feed line. That sits in the back of the car if I'm doing parks activations where I'm, uh, you know, I can drive into the park and set up at the back of the car. Um, and typically, just like Peter suggested, a sinker on some fishing line works well to get a line over a tree branch. I uh, use a um, 12 ounce um, uh, throw weight from an arborist supplier. Uh, on a line and use that to get a line over a tree branch to haul up the, the centre of the doublet. Uh, so um, I, I don't like carrying that on the, to the soda summits if we've got a significant walk, but you know, so I, either a squid pole or some sort of throw mass uh, on a line to toss a, a line over a tree branch. Um, and the key is Get the centre of your doublet up as high as you can. Get your doublet, whether it's a tuned half-wave dipole or leak dipole where each section is a tuned half-wave dipole. Um, get it up in the air and um, your feed line coming down. Uh, I've often used just RG58 extra mass, I know if I'm carrying it. Extra mass if you're carrying it for soda but a little bit lower loss than RG178 um, uh, to, for the feed line for a link dipole. Um, but something that's either resident or you've got an ATU that can tune it, get the center as high as you can, get it out in at least an inverted V as, with the ends as high as you can. And uh, that, that's half the secret of QRP as far as I'm concerned. And um, if you can use a tool uh, to spot yourself and uh, I might just briefly, uh, sorry, I can't show you because um, uh, I'm not allowed to screen share. Um, so, um, <clears throat> but the parksandpeaks.org website will allow you to spot for QRP contacts. So, um, so it's just simply parks, parks, P-A-R-K-S, N for Nelly, peaks, all one word, dot org. And you can, um, if you've registered on the site and logged in, you can spot yourself for simple QRP activity. It's primarily aimed at SOTA and parks activations, but you could also spot for other activities 
like uh, VK Shires um, and um, QRP activity and WWFF activity. So it's a very useful site. So if you're out there and you've got web access, parksandpeaks.org will allow you to spot yourself. And that makes it um, much, much easier for the activator, regardless of the activity you're undertaking. Thanks, Peter. The, um, just like to also thank uh, Paul Simmons from last week, joining us this week. G'day, Paul. Sorry, mate, I've just unmuted myself. Uh, thanks for asking me. Very no, interesting. Right. Very interesting, Peter, as always, mate. Thank you, Paul. Okay, who, who else can we uh, drag into the conversation? Come on, guys, I'm talking to myself. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come back into it again. Oh, no, not, not Mike. Well, nobody else is talking. <laughs> nobody can wait. You're running the show. You should yeah. be talking too. Uh, Peter, Peter Parker, in um, one of your uh, slides that you had up, you had, um, I'm not quite sure where it was, L174 cable. Is that what you use? Is that uh, the lightweight cable or? Um, um, there's the you know, RG174 is the common type of um, coax cable. It's very thin, but uh, yeah, normally I avoid the use of coax cable if I can, and usually use an in-fed wire going antenna going straight to the antenna coupler near the transceiver. So um, yeah, seldom do I take coax. Yeah, I just um, that's that's the second time I've. Uh, come across a, a lightweight uh, cable. Uh, one was with the other, with Peter, um, from VK5 uh, PAS. He had it uh, showing on one of his slides as well. Uh, I was just wondering, where do, you, where do you hook into that one from? Where do you get it from? Anyway. Yeah. No, no worries. No problem. Yeah. Hey, I know you can't get it a gay car or anywhere like that. <laughs> okay. Peter, good question for you. Um, the rumour that you're trying to use Port Phillip Bay as a counterpoise. Well, it's salt and it works. <laughs> <laughs> so is it is it true that you you've been seen dragging a, a wire behind you in the in the shallows yeah well the the wire thing um that was in my early experiments um and i stopped doing it because it was um troublesome because the varying when i was walking on sand the varying ground conditions were such that i would have to adjust the antenna coupler because the um different you know different sand conditions so then I went to having a, um, a metal ring that was submerged in the water. So provided I'm in the water from ankle to knee deep, then a ring that was just, I sort of had used that um, Velcro to wrap it around my ankle with a short wire going up to the transceiver. So yeah, um, that was that provided a much more predictable performance um, provided I was standing in the water. So um, that, that's what I do when I'm using the vertical antenna. You, you need, this, need the same warnings they have on golf courses in thunderstorms. Yes. <laughs> and also our stingrays and sharks and things. Yes, yes, imagine. All right. Well, gentlemen, um, and it was ladies, but now yeah, Lucinda has already dropped off. Peter was very kind enough to donate one of a copy of his book as a door prize. And just just um, pass on the details and I'll, I'll get it off to her. Yeah, Peter, I'll email you her contact and mailing details in yep. due course. And uh, thank you very much. It's absolutely appreciated. Um, it's hard to know what we can do for you in, in sort of 
as an act of uh, thanks, but um, in these COVID times and not being able to get out, it's not there's not a lot of preparation one can do. Oh, it's it's, it's been a pleasure, and uh, um, yep, yeah, uh, and look, uh, and uh, well, conditions will improve on HF over the next few years, and in the shorter term, we've got summer coming up, so there's a lot of opportunities there to make antennas and go portable. So there's lots of stuff on my website and also uh, my various books on Amazon and one of them in JCAR. So uh, have a look at those if, if you're um, interested at all in the topic. Thank you. And also one thing in our club, we've got a couple of members, myself and Bryce and a couple of others that are very keen on going up the bush and finding a quiet spot, mm. pitching tent or in my case, caravan um, and uh, throwing as many aerials as we can in the sky. Um, next time we organise one of those, once, uh, once we are able to, um, more than happy to uh, throw you an invitation to come and join us. Thanks for that. Much appreciated. Thank you, Peter. And can everybody un unmute and pass a round of applause, please? Thank you. Hey, Skilly. Yes. Got a problem. She what? went out and bought the book last week. I'll take it. So well, it's nice to know that Peter's advertising is working. Yes, <laughs> excellent. Uh, just, just one final comment for everyone, uh, if I may, Stuart. Yep. Um, don't rule out 80 metres, even in the middle of the day. At the moment, uh, I've been working uh, reliably out to ACT from the, the hills in Victoria on 80 metres in the middle of the day. Uh, 40 metres uh, NVIS just has not been reliable in the last few months. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, keep everyone consider having 80 metres as, as one of your options in your kit bag. And look out, looks like we've got a cat versus rabbit battle. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Peter. 80 metres is worth, worth a look at, for sure. Peter, I, right. mentioned, I mentioned 80 metres last or the other yes. week, Peter, and it's an absolute must if you're doing, well, park or SOTA. Um, it's just amazing what contacts you get even in the middle of a day. Yeah, I was listening to 80 metres yesterday, uh, just sitting in the shack and had 80 metres going and listening to Canberra, ATC. So it was coming through as if they we're just talking now. It was absolutely beautiful. And of course, you know, the, the great thing about portable too, on 80, virtually you have no noise yeah. as well. You can hear a pin drop. Uh, yeah. 80 metres is an absolute must. Very true. That's why you've got these city people that go up and camp out in the bush because of noise or, or lack thereof. Yeah. Uh, was it, what, uh, what was it, Bryce, was it last year, year before, we uh, was a place up, called McLaughlin's Bridge near Castle, Maine. And uh, it's a top little campsite with good facilities. It's just uh, you know, an open area. It's not a camping, it's a camping ground rather than a campsite. And uh, they've got some massive red gum trees there. You can get some pretty big aerials up in the air. Trees were beautiful. Oh, Sorry? Hi, <laughs> All right. Well, Peter, I would again, for, on behalf of the Melbourne Electronics and Radio Club, like to uh, thank you very much and your willingness to uh, um, participate was uh, was outstanding. And thank you very much. Con okay. Particularly considering we've we've bored you once before, so uh, it's nice nice to have a rerun. Thank you very much. Thank you. A pleasure. And uh, and uh, the offer continues if there's a future meeting or opportunity uh, I'm, I'm sure we can uh, drag something another presentation out so if you uh, run out and there will be another video on my youtube channel probably tomorrow on an interesting topic all right yeah. i'll pencil you in for our for when we when we're able to go bush camping again i'll pencil pencil you in for an invitation for that yeah. <laughs> I'll, right, put couple, I'll put a couple of lengths of the aluminium aside for you, Peter. 
All right. If nobody has any further questions, I'm going to uh, formally wind it up and thank everybody for participating. And uh, the, our two uh, alternate guests, both Peter and Paul, thank you very much for coming along. And uh, uh, again, thank you for the guys from Barrack for joining us. It was appreciated. And um, we'll, uh, we've got another one coming up on the uh 13th of November, we've, we've got, uh, Paul, you'll be impressed with this, we've got uh, Steve Adler joining us. Yeah, I saw that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, again, yeah, more than welcome to come along, Any, anybody. Um, if you don't get an invitation from me, just send me an email and uh, I'll send you the details. So, Just before so. you sign off, Rocky had a trouble with uh, the video. Anybody still, got any yeah. suggestions for him? Sorry, guys, that you're not going to have to see my pretty face this evening, but I'm not able to get video, but I'm seeing everyone and hearing everyone. So uh, thanks uh, to our speakers tonight. I really appreciate that. And uh, thanks, Stewie, for uh, putting it all together. Thank you, Rocky. Welcome. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, uh, we'll be publishing this on our... Uh, we're video recording this tonight, and we'll be putting it up on the um, on our, um, our new YouTube uh, channel. So if you search YouTube for VK3 FSK, the club call sign, Fox Sierra Kilo, you'll see this video in the next few days and also the one with Paul from two weeks ago. So uh, that's all up there. And we, we're trying to grow a, a reasonable collection of videos. So see how we go. All right. It's a good night from me, good night from the Melbourne Electronics and Radio Club, and thank you everybody for joining, and very much thank you to Peter VK3YE for doing what I think is a fantastic presentation. So um, yeah. just thank you.